Please welcome Trisha Rose. One of the most enduring and defining stories about America is that we are the land of opportunity for everyone, and that we are a meritocracy. In America, people succeed if they work hard enough. We're limited only by our commitment, our grit, and our gumption. In a meritocracy, the best rise to the top. This is a powerful and inspiring ideal. It gives us all hope and a sense of possibility that no matter where we come from, we have a chance and a fighting chance to succeed. But when we look at important measures of success, we see a disturbing pattern, a pattern that challenges the idea that everyone has an equal opportunity to succeed. When it comes to race in particular, the disparities in many key areas are stark, persistent, and long-standing. Let's take wealth, for example. The racial wealth gap is actually quite staggering, and it's consistent and stubbornly so for generations. The net worth of a typical white family is nearly 10 times greater than that of a black family. Recent figures show that whites have a median net worth of about $170,000. On the other hand, African Americans have a median net worth of 17. Now, this isn't a short-term or temporary gap. The long-term data shows that almost no progress has been made in reducing wealth inequalities between black and white households over the past 70 years. So what accounts for this stubborn and persistent gap in wealth? I mean, if we live in a meritocracy, and if we're the land of opportunity, why do white Americans continue to enjoy roughly 10 times the wealth of black Americans? If we cling to the belief that merit governs outcomes, we might be incorrectly led to believe that black people themselves are responsible for this extraordinary gap. We might think that black people just don't work hard enough. This is a pernicious and unfortunately popular myth. The truth is that these deep gaps are the result of an entire system, one that is largely hidden, that produce disadvantages in one area that accumulate in other areas and produce an entire discrimination system. This is what some people call systemic racism. Let me show you how it works. So let's go back to wealth. We have this wealth gap, but where does wealth really come from? For most Americans, wealth comes from home ownership and accrued increased value over time. Access to this really incredible wealth building engine was facilitated by an arrangement of, of federal programs about 100 years ago that were designed to create access to home ownership to many Americans who had previously been locked out. This, these programs basically built the American middle class. Some of them, like the GI Bill, were designed to expand home ownership and create wealth building opportunities. But these programs also had structures and ways to prevent and limit people of color from getting access to them. And when they did, the valuation of those homes were systematically reduced. One critical way that this took place was the connection of lending decisions, who would be allowed to have access to these low interest, stable loans um, that were basically racially determined. So they used a racially coded system that, for example, identified white neighborhoods, which at this point you know, were pretty segregated, and gave them a green rating, green for go, green for good, green for access to loans. On the other hand, black neighborhoods were given a red mark. And the red mark, which as we know is called redlining, that's where it comes from, were denied access to these favorable loans almost consistently. So this practice reinforced racial segregation, and then it created both a financial and a social value to white communities to preserve whiteness. Uh, as, as an economic and a social phenomenon. And this begins to produce a kind of consciousness of bias uh, that, that is reinforced financially. 
So within two years of the beginning of these programs, the federal government backed $3 billion worth of low interest loans for about a million mortgage holders. Within a decade or so, half of all new mortgages nationwide were financed this way. And almost all of them were reserved for white families. Let's take an example here. This is not the one I want to show you, but anyway. <laughs> um, in New York, <laughs> and I'm glad I looked up. Um, in New York and New Jersey, we found that out of 67,000 mortgages that were insured by the GI Bill, only 100 of them went to black and Latinx home buyers. That's 0.01%. In Mississippi, in 1947, only two of the more than 32,000 guaranteed loans went to black borrowers. Now, it's clear that home ownership is a wealth engine because home values typically appreciate over time. And this fuels not only the value now, but the intergenerational wealth. Our children and our grandchildren benefit from this. But home values are not automatically going up and appreciation is not happening equally. So what we find, in fact, that unlike their white counterparts, black homeowners typically experience home value stagnation and, frankly, depreciation. So the median appreciation rate for black homeowners is actually negative. Now, this is wealth and its connection to home ownership, but this isn't all that happens with this systemic advantage that we've created. We then take these advantages and we pour them into how we fund our public schools. So the financial advantages and disadvantages drive the unequal distribution of educational resources. How do we do this? Local property taxes are our primary way for funding public schools across this country. Schools in districts with higher property values generate more property tax income which then enables them to expand school budgets. Local property taxes make up close to 40%, close to 40% of all public school budgets. Some schools rely on property taxes as much as 60% to fund their programs. Recent studies by the Century Foundation calculate that school districts in majority black and brown areas allocate $5,000 less per student per year than majority white districts. So doing some basic math, which I did have to whip out my calculator for, because you know, I always back up with that. What, what do we end up with? 5,000 students um, would, um, in, in a district with 5,000 students would amount to a gap of about $25 million annually. So what we're seeing is not simply disadvantage here or there, not just an opportunity for some individuals to discriminate, but a discrimination system that accumulates and reproduces advantages in one area, like access to wealth building opportunities that are then reinforced in other areas, like producing better funded schools. And disadvantages in one area, like mortgage exclusions, which limit wealth, are reinforced by leaving less money for educating children of color. So in this brief presentation, I hope you can see how systemic racism works. And it's also quite clear that the playing field is not level. And hard work alone is not going to be enough. People of color struggle against a host of invisible and unacknowledged forces every day forces that are created by systemic racism. We will never be who we think we are, and we will certainly never be who we want to be if we do not work together to end systemic racism. Let's get started. Thank you very much. <laughs>